Next Gen Publishing. Uh, sorry, I just raced from another panel, so I'm um, uh, not quite New York, not quite indie. What are the new hybrid publishing models all about, and what can they do for you as an author? Uh, can somebody maybe get the door? You mind? Even though it's going to raise the temperature 10 degrees. I think that's really other problems. Yeah. Oh, it is? Got one more. Oh, yeah, one more. Sorry. Just coming Sorry. Late. Last time I was in here, it was available. Oh, yeah, if it was, it was totally um, It doesn't show up after that. Yeah. Back. <laughs> we'll do the 15 minute rule. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it's not going to dominate a lot. Well, my name is Todd McCoy. Uh, I'm a writer, uh, urban fantasy, um, since that's what I read the other night. <laughs> and, uh, um, I also have a small press called Hydra House, uh, not to be confused with the other Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the news, so yeah. positively. So. Yeah. Um, but I do mostly uh, sci-fi fantasy publishing here out of Seattle, and uh, I also have um, an electronic publishing component. I convert ebooks for people as well, so I'm sort of up to date with uh, most of the technologies that are going on. And so let me uh, introduce ourselves. Get on the line. Let us know who we are. No problem. Give him a hard time. Hi, I'm, I'm Dennis Upkins. Um, I'm a writer as well, an author. Um, pretty much I write in the um, urban fantasy, young adult, superhero genre. Um, pretty much I've worked with small presses and just so I definitely understand just trying to get your name out there, especially when you're trying to compete and let people know about you. So, um, it's definitely, it's very interesting because in, it's constantly changing too, but uh, I guess we'll get to that. I'm Patrick Swenson, I'm the editor and uh, owner and publisher of Fairwood Press, a uh, small press uh, uh, book line that started in 2000, or incorporated in 2000. Um, before that I was doing Tailbones Magazine, published for 14 years, and stopped that in 2009. And uh, also a writer, and sold my first novel, it's forthcoming for tour next year. And uh, Clarion West graduate, and you're up. You got your breath yet? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm just, to. I first of all, I was born in 1958. <laughs> <laughs> my first. My apologies for being late. I've just come from another panel, and I don't run too well. <laughs> but uh, my name is Shahid Mahmood. I own and manage another small press, Art Manor, with a science fiction imprint called Phoenix Pick. Uh, we've been around doing science fiction till since 2007 and uh, have a fairly good line going right now and you know here I am to answer any of your questions about publishing or whatever and I guess next generation of publishing which we all kind of tend to represent I guess to some extent. Yeah, I think probably already a lot more titles than I have <laughs> <laughs> started. He's a, he's a machine over here. Well what do we start with, let's just dig right into it, what, are the, what do we mean by hybrid publishing? Oh, that's what I wanted to know. Too. <laughs> yeah. well, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Anybody have an idea? I mean, is it? I mean, I have an. I, I, I suspect what is meant by that is uh, um, a sort of cooperation between the author and the publisher, more so than the traditional publishing models of the past. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And that probably perfectly. Next question. Oh, I oh, think. <laughs> I think we we'll just. Well, traditionally, anyway, it's been my experience, and from other writers I've spoken with, like with smaller presses, there is more of a one-on-one -on -one collaboration with the publisher and or the editor or whomever and the writer. So you definitely get a little more say in as far as like editorial decisions of the work and things of that nature. And so, from a creative standpoint, it really is you know more of a collaborative effort as opposed to if you're with a big publishing house and they're pretty much like, this is how it is or this is what we're going to do. So unless you you know established yourself in your have a little more clout, you can, but um, the trade-off is you definitely got to do a lot more legwork with the small publishing press. Even as an author, you know, I've had to create my own book trailers. I've had to set up, um, do contours, um, e-book tours, and things like that nature. So w the biggest, the biggest tool is like the uh, internet because it kind of evens the playing field. But you definitely do a lot more legwork, and you're probably taking on, on a lot more than say a bigger publisher um, would have resources for. And uh, if I could just, yeah. there is a lot of that, and you will tend to work a lot more closely, as you said, with the publisher. You'll have much more, they, they'll be more amenable to like working with you in the cover design, maybe, and all that. 
And that's fine, and you can work, and you can market yourself, and they can ask you to market. The one big red flag that should come up is if they ask you for money, mm -hmm. for marketing, or for quote unquote anything like that. That's when you got to take a step back and say, there's something wrong here, because publishers typically should not be asking authors for money. And there's a lot of that, you know, some published, some vanity presses really masquerading more as publishers now, it was become so easy. And uh, basically, their main source of income tends to be the author. Yeah. Uh, you got publisher, publish America, yeah. you know, things yeah. like that. Yeah. So you just have to be careful about that aspect about it. But on the other hand, it is a can be a very fulfilling experience working with a small press in this new thing where you have a lot of input. You know, it can be more like a partnership rather than just doing. You know, as a new author, you're not going to have any input in what going on with your book once you get the manuscript and that's it. You yeah. Know, to, an ex to an extent. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what I've loved about doing Fairwood is being able to work exactly. with the authors one-on-one -on -one and bring them in on the process. I mean, but make no bones about it. I, I'm a one-man show, so it's art direction. Uh, art director, that's me. Uh, you know, PR, which I never get enough time to do. Uh, I'm a full-time high school teacher, too. Um, you know, layout, design, sometimes cover art, um, I don't uh, ship out for it, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, there's a lot more one-on-one, -on -one, as, as you said, with, with that, and, uh, and I also like that when authors are willing to put in time, too, yeah. not, that's not, not, not money, uh, it's not their, their thing to have to worry about that, but um, if they're good out there on the internet and, yeah. and promotional you know, stuff, that's I, I, great, too, you know, it, make, it can make a big, big difference. That's that's largely how I've been doing it too with with my small press is that I'm I'm really collaborating with the with the authors and uh, uh, with the most recent book I put out uh, by Cat Rambo, um, she's been. I just uh, sat with her and she's oh, you did? yeah hanging out. Well, with she's her. she's great. I mean, she teaches classes on uh, social media, um, how to get out there, how to promote your book. So in a way, she was a natural to publish because she knew everything. And once the book came out. She put all of her skills to work at getting the book out there, and you know, and I think this is also part of this whole next generation of publishing. Um, authors are being asked to do a lot more in that respect. Um, I have other authors who don't do this as much, and frankly, you you do see this in the sales. You see it reflected in the sales. So I've talked to some other publishers and some authors, and, and I think that that's just one of those things that's becoming a reality, is that you just, as an author, you can't just sit in your, your closet well, anymore. The right? reality is you can't sit there, even with the big publisher. Yeah. I mean, you might have a publicist, and they might give you a few helps, and you're there, but for the most part, you know, yeah. unless you've got the, the big name and the big, uh, the big book deal. Well, you're, you're well some people do expect, I mean, well, if you get into a larger publisher, I think a lot of people still expect them to take on that role. Right. But that role is a direct role as far as the way you publish it. Which is kind of my For point, a new yeah. author, basically. Yeah. That's it. Well, and I mean, that was like when I was publishing my book. One of the biggest advantages was I was looking at this is an investment. Because with a lot of writers, they don't really get an established name until like they're five or six books in. So I'm working with Parker Publishing, and they've been great to me. And um, one of the things I kept doing was I kept doing a lot of promotions. I informed them of it. I, you know, I dropped Parker Publishing, everything just to let them know I'm building a relationship by doing that because then the next time when I have another book and I'm looking for them to publish they in their mind is this is someone who is willing to go out there not only promote his own work but promote the company and he's a marketable asset on that so hey guess what I've got a new story you want to buy it don't you yes because you know I'm gonna really work hard and promote you as well and I'm your walking PR so I mean just on that when you know you're representing the company and you build that relationship they will want to work with you, and you, that's another resource right there when you have that next title, and that keeps you from having to shop around if you don't want to, or what have you, but just building that network and getting that name out there. Oh, this is someone who's a real go-getter. This one is a really great writer to work with. You've already, you've got a reputation now. I approached a writer that, um, a lot of you probably know, I'm not gonna say her name, but uh, very well-known, uh, doing very well in urban fantasy sales, and, uh, so should we do a collection? So, yes, yes, yes. And she uses it for promo too. I mean, you know, she's she loves it. Be able to, another way to get her get the word out. And um, I said, well, here's it is. Here's what it is. And here's cover. And this is kind of what I get. You know, can throw toward cover. Um, and she said, I want to put. I want 
I want to get John Boccaccio for a, I don't know if you know John Boccaccio. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I want to invest a thousand dollars into there. It's like, well, you don't need to, I, I don't want you to. Like, but I want to, I'm going to think, can I ask, can you ask? Okay, I can ask. <laughs> Not even close to his is my asking rate. You know, New York artists. You know, not anymore. Mm -hmm. I remember John Bacchus when he was still doing tailbones. He first said, "Hey, it could be cool to do a cover for your projects." You know, when he was getting some traction, this is I could probably get something that maybe something I've already put well, yeah, way out of his price range and his ability to even have time to do it. You know, um, so that was not an option. But I found a good artist uh, that uh, for my rate that was perfect, and she was fine. But, you know, that's part of the hybrid of things, like she was willing to offer, it's like, you know, in the long run with my model, it's like, that makes you earning money back a lot sooner, because that art cost is not, you know, that, that comes off the, the, the profits thing, so, I don't know. Yeah, I, um, you know, I, 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 I want to operate my business where there's no cost to the author as well. Right. I mean, to me, that's, that's paramount, and that's sort of the benchmark. Of, of a small press is to, to just take, so the author is not doing the work. However, there are times where promotion, you know, there has to be something done. I keep thinking about an author who's, I talked to who has done some, she's been on the New York Times bestseller list a number of times, and I was astonished to find out that she spends like 80 hours a week working, like 40 of it is actually writing, and the other 40 is actually marketing, promotion, promoting her own work. <coughs> So what was just astonishing to me was that somebody at that level was still spending her own money doing her own advertising and her own postcards and she would sit down with people and just start handing out cards and or uh, bookmarks and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think at some level, you know, that you can only go so far with that, that hybrid model and then the author still, you know, prob will probably want to invest some of their own money to do something, but I don't expect it. I mean, I was just on a panel with Nancy Kress and Kevin Anderson. They're here promoting their stuff. And Kevin Anderson's got 50 bestsellers. Nancy Kress is like four Hugo's to measure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, but, but they still, as you said, they're, they're out there. Nobody's paying them to come here. They came here, I mean, on their own accord. And, they're, and the main reason they're here is basically they're promoting their work. Yeah. And uh, to that extent, and as a new author, you'll probably have to do twice as much as they do because they do have the name recognition already. Um, so that part is definitely there that you'll be have to go out there and you know spend your own money maybe and go out there and promote yourself. Yeah, especially as a expected. new author. Yeah. yeah, I think it's totally expected these days. Yeah. Um, if there are questions, you know, start you can throw them out. We can keep talking. What's the difference? You talk about how if an author self promotes, it helps sales. But what kind of sales are we talking about? What's low end and what's high end for small press? Oh, that's going to really vary, I think, it's from press to press. There's really no. You know, there was an article that came out uh, a week or two ago, and I hope I have my numbers right, but this, he was an Amazon best selling author. And he came out and he sort of spilled his guts and he said, here's exactly what happened. I was a best selling author on Amazon in the ebook category. For, he was on the list for what, a week or something? Yeah, at least a week, yeah, it was something like that. But it was like he could actually call himself a best-selling Amazon author. Yeah. And he came out and he said he sold 4,000 copies, I think it was. So how does that compare to what you can sell? Well, I have, my best-selling title is James Van Pelt's novel, Summer of the Apocalypse, and it's sold about 5,000 copies. And then, I don't know, I can't remember how many e-copies now are best roughly there but with my with my uh, you know with my printing uh, to, you know to with the print on demand technology which I use for, for mines like I can sell 300 books and be in the black you know depending on how much is spent on art which is for me is the big cost you know if, if I'm not uh, if I'm not careful uh, or if it's an anthology it's harder because you're you know those are hard to sell <laughs> well, make money back on so it kind of depends at least yeah and on volume, too. I'm only doing three to six titles a year. You're doing more than that right now. Yeah, I'm doing more than that. But I was just going to say, even like, for example, the books I publish. There's a book I published last year called, edited by Mike Resnick called Bug-Eyed Monsters and Rimbos. But that's a very niche market. It's parodies of science fiction stories. So if you haven't read science fiction, if you're really into it, you're not really going to get it. In fact, this guy left a really nasty review on Amazon saying, these stories didn't make any sense. Well, you know, for serious Asimov story, but the Asimov is parodying science fiction there. 
But anyway, for that book, when I was discussing, 750 is a number I had in mind. If I sold 750 copies of that, and this is a this is an anthology that has Asimov in it, and you know, edited Mike Resnick. On the other hand, there are author, you know, there there are certain advances I will make where I need to sell a couple of thousand. But I think very few small publishers look in tens of thousands. It's usually single-digit thousands. <laughs> you know, if I sell most of my books, like a couple of thousand copies, I'm pretty much, pretty much in the, even with the authors I deal with, pretty much in the black then, and I'm happy. Well, even with mine, it was um, Parker Publishing. They they primarily deal with romance for people of color, for women of color. They're now branching out into young adult and speculative fiction. Mine was one of the first titles. So mine sold very well, but in relation to, it's that's another factor because romance typically sells really well, but then you've got to deal with, other, like he was saying, different niche markets too. So if mine, say for instance, only sold a couple of hundred, that's still good because that was them in branching out into a new genre. So yeah, it's all subjective. Yeah, that's right. Oh, the guy in the back here, you were um, question. How, how do you structure your contracts with, you know, with the expectation that the authors are doing more legwork? legwork? Are the contracts a little more uh, beneficial for the author than a traditional contract might be? Well, in my case, I think it is. I really do. Um, you know, I'm very small. I, you know, I just started my press about a year and a half ago, and I have, uh, I think, five or six titles, something like that. So it's not that many. I'm building it up. I don't have the capital to pay people, uh, especially advances up front. So, like a lot of small presses, there's a profit sharing model. Um, so I, but I invest all the money into it. I make sure that everything's taken care of, uh, and then on the back end. Um, I make a very generous royalty payment to them on a biannual basis, basis uh, that's much, much nicer than like the, uh, the bigger publishers would offer. But, you know, the flip side of that is uh, um, like with short story collections, which is largely what I've put out at this point, they don't sell that much. You know, you don't, so there's not that much that's been, you know, that like the press has really made at this point. But, um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been a no advance person since the start, but 50% of profits are, go to the author. So, I mean, Jim and Pelt on that one book has made more with uh, those 50% of profits, plus buying copies for himself at half price covers, covered price, and selling them on his own. He's made far more than he would have ever made uh, selling a story collection. Even, but this uh, this was a novel that he would have made probably in any big publisher. You know, he's made well over you know 10, 12, 15 k on that book. You know, just his half. So, but then there's others that don't really earn out or not very well. It's like you know, here's your twenty dollars this month and, and uh, <laughs> keep plugging away. But you know, they're happy to have stuff out there too sometimes. So. Yeah. But you never know what's going to sell and what's not going to sell. You hope you you know when you're picking. But sometimes it's for the love too. You just love a project and you believe in it. So we got a lot of hands. Yeah. yeah so, uh, to, you, yep. I just wanted to mention when you said that going out to events is really important for a young author. Last year I went to a panel that Dennis was on and about new writers. And as I listened to him talk about his book, I bought it on my phone. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right then in the room, right? Yeah, right in the room. So fairwoodpress.com. <laughs> Online. In the dealer room, too. <laughs> so, um, given that a, a lot of your um, runs might be in the hundreds or in the single digit thousands, how would you handle it if you had a book that had unexpected success where it just. Vegas. Beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're not, I mean, we're not as. Uh, the word I want. Uh, rich? Well, that's true. <laughs> Not rich. Sorry. But the, the, the demands of the, the, big, the big publishing companies, or the ones who are really, you know, the next step up, the independent, well, now I see now they're indies, but independent, like, so let's say Nightshade, right? Everybody know what Nightshade is? Uh, the book that nearly broke their bank was Paula Pachacolupe, Pachacolupe, yeah, Wind Up Girl, <laughs> that book, and it just, you know, because they're, they're distributing, they're getting into bookstores, and suddenly, they have to print, and they, you know, and now they're, they've been struggling money-wise. So most of the sales, I don't know, what, I don't know who buys my books, right? 
I just go online to the little live data things like, oh look, I bought sold 40 copies of this title. And most likely it was in an online venue, Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Books a Million or, or an independent bookstore um, who will order directly from Ingram. Um, so this, I don't know, that was part of your if you have a success, then what are you going to do? Because you, you got to print hundreds of books. Well, the only print them is as you need them. And I don't fulfill a lot of orders from my website or from my house. I'll get library wholesaler orders, you know, X amount at a time, not huge. And I just kind of watch my inventory, go, I need four more of copies of that, 10 more of those, 20 more of those, mm -hmm. and, uh, and minimize the damage of having too much overstock. And most of that stuff, you know, gets printed, at least with the print-on-demand uh, technology, uh, gets printed and sent, and I never see it. I just see the money, which is kind of cool. <laughs> you know, I think that's part of the, you know, the whole next-gen publishing thing, too. I think, uh, um, as publishing has gotten um, easier, I guess, uh, you know, and more people, and the self-publishing thing is, is really taken off, you know, more people are able to get into publishing, um, and they're able to set up, you know, through CreateSpace and Lightning Source and Lulu, you get your book out there, uh, and there are some really nice distribution agreements, like Lightning Source is part of Ingram, so you can get your book actually in the Ingram catalog. Uh, that doesn't always mean it's going to get to the bookstores. Um, nine times out of ten, maybe not even that, um, it just, it, nobody knows about it. Um, um, and you have to work to get people that are interested. You have to find other ways to get people interested other than going to a bookstore to find your book. You know, come to your website or something or get onto Goodreads and get that social, this comes back to social media getting out there and getting on Twitter or something. And it goes back to the, the big model again too, which is, you know, you send, oh good, I got 100 copies out to these two bookstores and like, you get 75 of them back. That would kill me. I would be, I would be dead. So I can't do, I don't do returns. I tried it once with a couple of books and it costs more than to print them to, when they, to get them returned. Or even pulp the return was about kind of a wash, but it was just too much of a hassle. So most of the big chains, which there's not very many of those left, but uh, even independent stores are not going to order. First of all, if they don't get their full 40% discount, but also if they can't get a returnable unless they can directly order from you or they believe in it well enough to keep copies and, and not return them. Yeah. So, how about you? So, hypothetically speaking, if J.K. Rowling came to one of the small guys with the first Harry Potter book... Now? Or yeah, if she had done that, oh. uh, and suddenly it takes off, would you guys have approached one of the big houses or would you have been able to handle millions of copies? What would have, the, what would have happened? If it well, sold as much as J.K., if it sold Oh, we'd have figured it out a way because I'm not going to be anywhere. If I have to go door to door and hand them and sell them, hi, I have a new book. Jake, yeah, I, no, we're keeping I mean, that money in the family. Did, Jay, did Scholastic know that they're going to sell that many on that first uh, book? No. Right? I mean, no. No, and it broke Scholastic for Yeah, them. yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, the and they're a big difficulties. And they're big boys and, and big girls. Boys. So, so yeah. how would you do it? Oh, we'd figure out a way. <laughs> <laughs> you cross that bridge, you know. So you would never leave the publisher and partner with them. I mean, well, if, well, never say never. Yeah. So here's a here's the thing with so I uh, first and then Mr. Angler, you're next. Um, Thank you. You bet. You penny had it well. Um, I bought uh, Jay Lake's novel, The Ro Rocket Science. It's his actual first novel before the tour books. Um, and it was one of those things we were looking, talking to him, what do you want to do if you want to do a project? Sure. It's like, give me some options. And I said, no, no, no. <coughs> oh, yeah, oh, this one. It's like, yeah. I, my agent decided it was good for a small press. Didn't think she could sell it um, in, in, the, in the big market. It says, and I read it. I said, this is awesome. This is great. Published it. And it did really well on my end. And soon enough, here comes her agent going, so on the contract, so the mass market and the, the form sales, are those open? Because all of a sudden she saw how well it did, and he told, he'll tell you that he got his tour contract. A big part of that was uh, the success of, of Rocket Science, but you know that helped. So I had there was interest from that agent at that point. But but like in answer to your question, it is a matter of resources. If you see that yeah. much demand, at some point, at least I would be looking at some other because I just don't have the resources for that distribution. Right. Right. And basically, I'm killing myself by not looking at other options. Uh, you know, one has to be realistic. I'm a small press, there's only that much I can handle. Uh, I'd love to have a DK Roll income or some of my books take off like that, but in which case, at this point, I would have to rely on other resources to get that whole distribution thing going. 
You know, it sort of brings up an interesting point because if your book takes off and sells a lot of copies, you know, is a publisher then going to want to buy it because it's already sold a lot of copies? But, you know, that's sort of an open question. That I don't yeah. know that anybody's really tested at this point. No. Well, I've known this, um, I have one buddy and her book, she went with a small indie press and it sold pretty well, but then a bigger publisher who was a fan of her work, they went and re-released it. And so, and then because they have more bigger resources, they were able to hit it on a bigger market. So right. it's one of those things of, if it does well on an indie, it might do well, but you know, you slap on a new cover and really give a new marketing push, people won't mind buying it again. I mean, how many times have, you know, when they come out with a new edition of Harry Potter, they still sell well, so it is it is possible. And, and if, I you guess have, I'm, oh, go ahead. if you have a hot commodity, then contracts can become negotiable. Even though typically a big publisher will always has the upper hand, even when dealing with smaller publishers. But if you're looking at a hot commodity and they're interested in it, you know, there are ways of then dealing with the issue and getting terms that are favorable to yourself also. I think I didn't quite finish my, my point of the other one, which was I worked out a, a, a deal with his agent, for, or Jay Lake's agent, about if they sold the mass market to a, a big publisher, I mean, you know, as far as the rights and all that kind of stuff and the, and the advance money and all that. So then well, that's a partnership, but, you know, it was like, I, it'd be fine with me if you, if you sold that. Um, but I didn't have some of the other rights. I didn't buy the, the e-rights or, or the, the foreign rights and stuff. Go, man. Yeah. You know, I wanted to point out that the um, the percentages are so interesting, and it's hard to tell sometimes between a large publisher and a small publisher and publishing yourself what's going to be most beneficial. Um, my first book, which was nonfiction, has now sold forty thousand copies, but it was with a big publisher. Um, I just released a novel myself. If I sold, I don't know, three thousand of those maybe less than that, I'll have made more money. So, you know, you have to weigh a lot. And I will say that I'm working very, very hard now to market this novel, but I'm working no harder than I did on the first book that had a publisher and a publicist that was specifically designed, or, or specifically designated to me. Um, I mean, my co-author and I did 50 radio interviews and television interviews, and we were in the newspaper, and on and on and on and on. It was the same amount of work I'm doing now. So Is that hardcover or trade? Or was that hardcover? Trade. Trade. Okay, yeah. But you're looking first of all at two different markets. You're looking at nonfiction versus fiction. Yeah, it's a, you're right. The, the first right. you have to give a last to that. Secondly, selling three thousand copies on your own as a self published author is an incredibly great job. Uh, I know it compares to like, you know, what forty thousand, whatever, but it's most self-publishers will not even reach a few hundred. That's just the way it is right, right. now. Right. So 3,000 if you get there, I mean, and the, you also have the experience, you're a published author, and you may well get there. There are people who will get there, but it is quite, a, quite an achievement, yeah. even right. getting to 3,000. Yeah. And the point. biggest thing you miss out with that is, that especially for new authors, the biggest thing a major publisher is going to do is get your bookstore, book in a bookstore. And that's yeah. where a lot of the sales come. A, a, that's the impulse buyer who's going into the bookstore, sees a beautiful cover, and picks it up. They're not going to search for your name on Amazon, right. but they don't know who you are. Right. Uh, so that's what the big publishers will get you as a new publisher, really. Yeah. Even though they'll take away all your rights and all that, and you're saying, child. <laughs> but that's besides the point. That's what a small publisher. That's what a small publisher could help you with too. Besides, yeah. the indie, because indie, you know, yeah. a, a, a small publisher that has. You know, some backlist and some some success. Yes. At least a little bit of street cred can help you too, because at least there's you know there's some word out there. Definitely. Leah. Um, I just, yeah, I'll go back to my original question. Uh, though I have had better success uh, than just a few hundred with yeah. with with my with my independently published stuff. It was traditionally published, and now it's backlist, so it's going out. But the new stuff is also selling well. Um, I wanted to ask the the panel of. Since we're doing the next gen pub, uh, publishing, if they'd ever thought about uh, cooperatives, I'm part of Bookview Cafe, which is an LLC, and it's a group of published authors who have bond, bond together to, and we do our own. We do each other will do copy edits and covers and, and things like that. And so it's a it's a publishing corporation because it's an LLC, but it's cooperative of of. Uh, Sarah's a 
Yes. Sarasatel is part of it. Ursula Le Guin is part of it. Yeah, okay. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, Irene Radford. Yeah. Well, actually, Irene Radford, who's part of it. And Irene Radford is part of it, yes. First came came to me quite a while ago, actually. It was kind of started and was asking about, you know, boom, print arm, you know, to have a print arm and stuff like that. You know, it was very intriguing. It was just like, I just. I'm doing three to six tiles a year, and all the, if, you, if I'm going to add to that besides what I have, or how many you're going to want, and they said, well, yeah, it might be a problem. And so I had, because of my schedule and smallness, <laughs> I couldn't. But it's a fabulous, it's a fabulous idea if you can if you work that, make that yeah, run. Well, we're, we're starting to get bigger. We, one of the titles yeah. just hit New York Times bestseller, so. Sweet. It's funny you mention that because um, in addition to writing, I also do a lot of work in like social justice groups for women, people of color, LGBTQs, particularly representation of us in the media. So I have been, I've had the privilege of connecting with a lot of queer writers, women of color, um, just in other um, just marginalized groups. Many of us, we, while not an official corporation, this does come to networking. And when one of us, we become really good personal friends. So when one of us has a book. It was we had an email exchange like when's your book coming out? Hurry up! We ain't gotta we gotta do promotions. We gotta do this. I have to promote like just that. So we help promote each other, and they may have uh, they may have readers or fans who wouldn't have may not necessarily have picked up my book, but by them endorsing me and promoting me, they're gonna check me out and vice versa. And so we help build and promote. So even for something on that, even if you don't do it, just by networking and working with other authors and just connecting of that of. Here, go check this person's out. They've got a new book, or this person's got a new book. That will that helps everybody because no one's there's not an either or with writing, and a lot of people have that mindset of, well, if I bought this book, I'm not buying this one. No, they're going to buy everyone's, and they're going to buy as much as possible. So, definitely, that's a, and even with that, that will definitely boost your sales as well. We have another right question. There, yeah, right there in the aisle. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've been wondering about is. A lot of general talk has been going on about like promotions, <laughs> but like um, some promoting techniques are a lot more costly than others for someone who's like doesn't have uh, a big budget. And the other thing is, a lot of writers are, or at least some writers are introverts, and like I feel like there's all of the networking advice people give are for extroverts, and I feel like I've started to learn how to network as an introvert, but it's a very different technique. So I was wondering if any of you could speak to either of that points, like, I know that's a little beyond the scope, but like, more cost effective ways of promoting yourself, or how to promote yourself, and network as an introvert. I'm an introvert, so, you know, <laughs> no, believe it or not, when I'm now in a, an environment like this, or when it's professional, it's go time, I can put, I can turn it on, but typically, yeah, I'm more scared, so, but I, so I, I get it, and I totally understand. Um, when I when Hollow Snow, my first novel came out, I had no budget, but I knew I have to promote and really go out there. Luckily, I had been blogging for many years and had a small respectful following on um, live journals, some other places, just by doing social justice and I had network. Well, I, I did a locked post because I was just like, just to let my free readers know, it's like, hey, so I've got a book coming out. It's a small publisher. Would anybody be interested if I did like an ebook tour? Like, you can ask me questions, or I could write a guest post for your blog, whatever you want to do. If you're interested, I was expecting maybe like two or three people to be interested. I got like this whole hit of people like, yeah, you can write a guest post for me. I love your writing, or blah 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 blah, or what's your advice on getting published? And then it got to the point where it's like a couple people emailed me a month later. It's like, um. Is it okay if um, I can promote your book? If you have time, can you pencil me in? If you're still, in, and I'm just sitting here like, you're wanting to help promote me and make me money, and yeah, yeah, I'm gonna turn you down. I'm just like, I'll, I, I think we can pencil you in. I had a cancellation. <laughs> with the thing with the internet though is, if you're not someone who's who's, if you're camera shy or you that face to face interaction, when you get the set emails, you can answer them. It, it's a little bit more in your control, so you know how to do it. That's a really huge advantage there. Um, doing guest posts or guest blog posts really helped a lot because a lot of times with people who have blogs, they may they may not want to always turn out content. So when you're like, hey, I can write a blog post for you, yeah. that helped out a lot. And interesting love. I think I did more writing promoting the book with the guest post than I did actual <laughs> writing the novel, which was interesting. But and then people linked and then people shared and it just got around. 
And so that really boosted, and I got readers from people I wouldn't have even expected. So if I do a guest post and one person checks out my book or at least considers it, that's a victory right there. But if three or if, if I get a couple of people from each one and they went and bought it, win. So that's that's one avenue there and did not spend one cent. Now you get time to figure out what you want to say. Mm -hmm. You know, not out of the gun. If it's you know shy kind of thing, it's like you know. Get a good picture once in a while. Pop it up there. There's my picture. Other oh, bottle. Um, and anything you can do to eliminate, limit, eliminate. Well, that would be nice too. But a limit cost, you know, is 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 great. I I don't have a big budget for for PR and stuff. I mean, I do advanced reading copies. I do a lot of reading copies and send those out to the review venues. But you know, I get people at you know the magazines asking me for, hey, since you're going to have something here, why don't how about buy a you know an ad, you know, for thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. I don't even talk about the Rolling Stone one was when they came, I don't know how they got my name, but it's like, oh my god, this is more than I spend on, you know, 10 books all at once, so, um, but like, I can get in Locus, um, the, the book title in Locus for like three or four times and not pay a cent, you know, if you play it right, it's just like, but their books, uh, books sold section, then books received, and then forthcoming books, and then if you get a review, there's four times, you know, in front of the people who read the, the trade, but that's only the trade, trade people, it's not really, but word of mouth, I think that's the best. Still yeah, I promotional, so whatever you can do to get word of mouth out. In you fact, know, so you write the best thing you can. In fact, paid advertising, I don't even know how much it's worth it for books. I don't know. It, I've done the margins are so small that I don't know whether it's really even worth it. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And same thing with reviews. I mean, I've had great reviews for books and not seen a single object. Yeah. yeah. And vice versa. I've done like yeah. uh, I did do an ad for Goodreads, and I did like the little the giveaway thing. And my feelings on Goodreads is kind of mixed, just with some of the some of the drama that goes on there but just from the advertising there were it did open me up to people who came and checked out my book and I got like a lot of hits on that score so the next with my next book coming out I'm planning on doing the same with uh, Facebook yes you are shelling out a little bit of money but because it is a huge demographic you do have a re that's one in my opinion is worth investing in you know it was out of my pocket I did this on my own but it wasn't too expensive and it did reach out to a lot of people and I did like a giveaway that if you participate I'll mail you two copies and now on top of that I gave them a comp who are the winners I gave them a complimentary digital copy too with a special edition with a new cover that I created for it that was a success too so stuff like that and then and that spreads word of mouth of hey I won in the copy I went and reviewed this uh, I read the story I liked it or this wasn't feeling and got a favorable review that's advertisement there as well. Here's something to do uh, uh, that uh, I used to do for Tailbones for quite a while, although it was a pain and kind of a time sink, but I did see some rewards from it was around the country there are literally two, three, four conventions like this every weekend. And Locus and other venues show what they all are. So, you know, if you go to, now you got Instaprint, which is great, you know, you can get tons of good stuff for relatively cheap, but wherever you might get bookmarks or a flyer or something, and you go and there's contact emails for the, for the you know, upcoming conventions. You email, say, like, hey, I'd like to send some flyers for the freebie table, you know, wherever that might be. And I'd send, okay, how big is the convention? How is, how, you know, because it usually will have those numbers too. Is, you know, it's attending 1,000 people or 3,000 or 125. I mean, so you figure out how many you're going to send, which you never send as, as many as you think you would like to do. But, and then, you know, if you're not worried about getting them back, you know, they just, there's somebody on the other end who goes over oh, the freebie table, you know, freebie table, and it'll get out there. So that's another kind of, but it's postage and mailing and stuff and skin. You know, sometimes you've got to spend money on it. I, I always look at it as just, you know, you spend money in your career sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. just, you know, you spend a little bit. I send it to a region where you're not in. I sent a lot yeah. of them to regions out of the Northwest that I never got to for conventions. So, And I think you'd be surprised at, like, how many people out there are actually willing to help promote. I mean, especially with the self-publishing movement, there's a lot of cottage industries and people, like, doing these things. You know, I'm surprised at how many... Um, um, like some of the authors that I that I work with and have talked to, they do blog tours, which is kind of what you were talking mm -hmm. about, you know. And people are perfectly willing to, uh, you know, to, you know, most people are like, hey, somebody's going to write something that I to put on my blog so that I don't have to do the writing, you know. And another thing is, there are a lot of fans out there who do book reviews. They have their own setup of book 
they do book reviews. I've got one friend, she's one of the most voracious readers I've ever met, and so now she just does book reviews. She's had the opportunity to interview a lot of authors, they do guest posts and stuff like that. Take advantage of them, because a lot of times what I've seen too is that some authors think, oh, you're a blogger, you're, or you're not an official magazine, or you're not paying anything, you're not a real, you're not legit, or whatever, but it's like, no, take advantage of those fans, because they have a lot of readers, or they have a lot of huge yep. following, so it's like, you let them know, hey, I got a new book, is there any way, what's your policy on promoting and stuff like that? They would be happy to have an up-and-coming author or an established author come on and, because that, that gives them credibility and that boosts them up because it's like if you have another hit, hey, I knew them win. So it, it helps out both and that also gets your name out. And again, not a cent is spent. Uh, uh, how do you, uh, when do you feel was the biggest change between what we're calling here hybrid publishing as compa uh, compared to traditional publishing. When did you uh, believe you start to see that turnaround? Ebooks. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think with the the launch of of ebooks. I mean, in ebooks, you know, the, the ebooks do have a long history. I think the first first ebook was uh, back in the about 1970. Somebody had typed in the Declaration of Independence, you know, something like that. It was considered the first ebook. So they've been working on it for a long time, but it really wasn't until, of course, Amazon came out with the Kindle and created a market that people sort of went, "Woo, ebooks!" and and then opened up uh, for self-publishing, uh, especially with the print-on-demand technology getting better and better. Uh, distribution outlets so that uh, the books could get printed and get to the consumers. Uh, and I would have to say uh, that is largely what instigated me. I mean, I've been involved in uh, uh, publishing since, you know, 2000 and even before that. Uh, but I started this one a couple of years ago just because I looked at the, I looked around and I said, hey, I can do what I was trying to do before, but now I can do it a lot cheaper. I can, I have more resources. Uh, the quality of the books is a lot better than what I could have done before. There's a lot of outlets, especially with the digital media. I mean, I, I work as a tech writer by day and you know I, I know the technology pretty well so I sort of adapted to it fairly easily so I felt like it was a, a natural for me to go into Lalan.com R-A-L-A-N Raylan sorry I don't I don't know of course I think Raylan Gillens now which I've seen it's my southern. The same way, it's my southern <laughs> accent. That's what brought that up. Um, a water cooler. I think that's the name of the website. They also list a lot of publishers, and they have forms, and they add, and they mention the reviews on them. Is that the name? It's like uh, water cooler. Uh, absolute right. Huh? Absolute right. But they have a water cooler section. Yeah. That's one thing. But absolute right is another one. Is it Sifo? W R I T E. Hmm? Sifo doesn't Sifo have? Right. Yeah. Um, There's a fairly new one out called Submission Grinder. Yeah, that's the Kickstarter that, right? Well, no, it, it, it's up and running. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I haven't popped in on it. But yeah, that's the uh, competitor to... What was the question? <laughs> oh, how, how, how to find, find small presses. Other presses and that are... Yeah. Sip, Sip up has a blacklist. They have a blacklist, right. Okay, that's Which is actually a very really good resource. Yeah. Let's check it if you if your publishers on the blacklist. A writers beware. A Victoria yeah. Strauss or run that. That should be the second place you go to. Yeah. The finding of finding, people. Yeah. Check them. Sifwa, science fiction writers of America. I was sitting here wondering, what, what are you talking about? Why have I never heard of this? And I was sitting like, I should also mention science fiction writers of America. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -huh. uh, you talk about like I mean hybrid and, and, and unique, interesting development with hybrid publish hybrid publishing is with the kind of things like Kickstarter and stuff. So the, the second title I'm done doing, um, Beyond the Sun, that Brian Thomas Schmidt is editing, it was a Kickstarter with stories by Nancy Kress and Silverberg and Resnick, and um, it funded. And he came to me and said, well, before it funded, he was asking about a publisher, and it's like his names, maybe yeah, and. Um, you know, that the, a lot of the front costs is for paying for the stories and for. I mean, the, talk about for the ones that are ordered or up front, and then I still have my cost, you know, for, for creating things, and then I yeah. split profits with Ryan on that because he didn't leave much for himself for Kickstarter. So let me talk about a hybrid model. I mean, Kickstarter, where <laughs> the money is just there; it's free, and you're like, 
you can do what you want. There's no risk. You, I mean, it's it's really appealing actually because you know, given a big pot of money, like I've seen a couple of these Kickstarters for books go up to I don't know, almost a hundred thousand or something. Uh, and, sorry, I'm sorry. Womanthology Volume One uh, broke over a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in funding. <laughs> I mean, you could put out a pretty sweet book, <laughs> you know, and you could do whatever you wanted, um, and it wouldn't matter if it didn't sell. I mean, honestly, I mean, you want it to sell, but I mean, that's just the nature of that. You're like, wow, that's a that's a pretty nice deal to have just all that free money come in. Did you have a question, or you oh, have one? Sorry. I have a question. Um, can Can you walk us through the as writers the process of getting connected with uh, a small press? Um, Aside from just looking on the websites, you know, what will help us identify one that, that is well suited to us? What do we want to look for in, in a small press? Um, and what is the process? process? Do, we, do we send queries or, or you know, how do, you, how do uh, writers approach you? For me personally, just, and I know since these are publishers, just being in the role of writer trying to connect with um, with other writers, having an online presence helped, and then networking um, through different people, just meeting up, coming to cons like this, getting FaceTime with editors and stuff, you know, checking out, if you're going to the dealer's room, you know, buying their work, and, you know, just small talk like, hey, are you all ever looking for anything, or what are you looking for? Um, asking questions, so getting FaceTime like that, and then you know if you ever do a follow-up, really, and I hate to say this, networking and it's who you know that has gotten me a lot more opportunities than really anything else. Um, once Hallstone came out, a lot of people came knocking on my door. I was still out there, really working for it, but just someone was like, "Well, I've got a friend that they're in, they're at one of the heads of one of this uh, small con, and they would love to have you." Okay, well, I've got this. I'm actually I, a friend of mine who's a musician. He goes to like a lot of animes or a lot of sci-fi cons. You ought to go on there. I got a buddy. He's on there. We can get you uh, hooked up. So, I mean, just networking and just being involved in the groups and stuff. Don't go in with the mindset of, I'm going to friend you just to use you as a means to an end. But just networking and just figuring out what's a good market or how your work is marketable or what gives it, uh, what makes it unique. And just working and networking. I mean, it won't happen overnight, but it's just like when lightning does strike, all you need is that one novel, one place, the right time, and then you, you, your career from that point sky's the limit. Most, most publishers on the websites are going to have the guidelines for submission, guidelines. queries, and, and all that, how you do it. As far as if it's right for you, you know, you look at the, the beware list, the blacklist, the beware, beware writers list, you look at how many titles they've got, you look at who they've published, you know, I mean, I've, I've got about over 50 titles now. Um, but some really great names that, that uh, I'm really proud of. Um, but beyond that, you know, you just got to do a little bit of homework to find out. Um, you know, yeah, and I think that takes that's, one. That's, and, yeah, I mean, what they're publishing is it compatible with what you're doing? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, don't send in a you know dark fantasy to some a space opera house that's specializing in space opera. So you know, you've got to really do your research, and I guess the web is the best way to do it or meeting people. But but you'll be able to tell you know books that are compatible with what you've written. Basically, and then I just said submission guidelines and all that, and see what. Like we just came. And each house would be different. The, the panel just came from um, um, the uh, guest of honor, <laughs> uh, Bain Books. Uh, Tony. Tony uh, was talking about how Bain Books doesn't take YA. So I mean, that's just one of those little research things. You know, like if you're writing a YA, you're not want, going to Bain. They want to start a YA. They well. It's like we don't take that. So yeah, I would just you know, and, you know, I think social. This comes back to social networking too. You know, getting to know people a little bit. You know, definitely face to face helps. And if you're going to places like these, I mean, you're in the dealer room. Yes, I am. Right? So there's a whole table of his books, my books in the dealer room. Um, so when you know the small presses are here at the conventions, you know, you can get a taste. There they are. The physical copies. How do they look? Are they? You know, and maybe you don't want to just walk up and start in on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, no, no. To no, buy us a drink first. I'm just saying, about <laughs> <laughs> or so support you, their work. Or dinner. What well, you like? <laughs> <laughs> or dinner. You buy every book and then read them, and you know, from the newsroom. They won't That's press everything. Every, yeah. Copy yeah. Of everything, right? <laughs> everything, and then figure out what you want. Okay, we're just down to about. Just come meet us, talk to us, and you know, we'll be happy to. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think it goes for a lot of publishers, you know. Not everybody, um, but, you know, most of them are pretty open, and especially, you know, we're here at cons too to meet people. It's mm -hmm. not like we're here to board it over people or, you know, 
so you know we, we want to meet writers and we're always looking for new stuff and it just depends on what we're looking for so um, you know it's just matchmaking in a way mm -hmm. it's just, you know. so we do down to about three four minutes do we have any other uh, questions that people want to ask I have to come up with another question um, <laughs> I will, say, I will say this though, um, no, whatever advice, the one advice I've always gotten, and this was from a writer before Hollow Snow, because I was debating, you know, I was trying to get some advice on my career and everything, before my first book came out, and she gave me this advice which has stuck with me, and it, it is, it's, trite as it sounds, it's really a deeper meaning. The ones who make it, every author that made it, is the one that doesn't give up. So. I'll tell you right now, it is hard, especially in this market right now, because everything is sort of in a, it's taking a downturn. It's going through a transition, and really no one knows how it's going to pan out. Um, also, look at it as an investment. Your first book might not make you put you on the New York Times bestseller. Most books, it takes about five or six. So look at it as an investment. If the first one doesn't sell, keep turning them out, keep turning them out. So by the time you have, an, you have something established, so just keep working, keep at it. If this is what you want to do, if this is your passion, it will happen. It is inevitable. Just stay at it. You know, I mean, publishers, we, we don't get into this business to make money, but cause it's, it's just a fact. I mean, but we need to make money to survive. So we're always looking for something that's going to work. And we want, I mean, we want to publish something that, that we can knock out of the ballpark and make a writer as much as a writer wants to be made. Mm -hmm. So there's a partnership there, you know, so we're always looking for the right thing. <clears throat> no question back. I have a single shot. I mean, I'm doing mostly collections, okay. some novels, um, and some anthologies. But, um, and I, I wouldn't have the resources to probably commit to too many books as such. I think for most, That's my we're, experience too. We're just, you know, I think most are going to take one. They're, they're going to say, okay, we can work with this. But, you know, assuming, you know, you also want to see a writer that's writing. You know, you've got other books in the works, that's great. Well, let's see how this one goes. Um, <coughs> I'd love to do another one. Um, you know, it all sort of depends, you know. I mean, every couple of years I ask Jim Van Pelt, are you ready yet for another anthology? Because I've done probably a story collection, because these stories. He's a story writer, fabulous writer, and I've done four of his collections. So I give him a couple of years to get a few uh, more sales on there, and then we do something. So that's about as much as I get. It's not. It's all one at a time. I don't contract him out that much. What if you have a story that is like in your head is a trilogy? How would you approach that situation? Like, would you write the whole trilogy and then go to someone and say, I have a you know, how, how do you approach that? I would probably, because I had a similar situation with that, I would write the first book as it can stand on its own with the potential to be a trilogy. And if that does well, because in my contract, which I have my publisher, they get first rights if there's if I do a sequel or spinoff or something with a major character. So if it does well and they're interested in it, it can stand alone, but it can also, you can pick up, but I wouldn't go in with, like they said, it's a trilogy for the reasons they cited. I, I, I gotta cut it off there. It's okay. five till. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Woo! Nice. Sorry, you didn't. I did. Oh. Nice to meet you.